teaching them that whatsoever I have told you, teaching them and admonishing them and sharing with them what I've told you. Mark 16 says basically the same thing. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And then of course the benchmark power mess a scripture, Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8, and ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. I've got something gnawing at my mind and something that's working on my head when I realize we cannot be a witness without the Holy Ghost. we got to have the Spirit of God in order for us to be a witness. And I want to tell you something else. There ain't enough devil out there in the world. There ain't enough debauchery and immorality to stand against a pure witness of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We have just as much power and just as much authority in the world that we live in today as they did when the Holy Ghost first fell. We have a tendency to be somewhat intimidated by the nuttiness that goes on in our world. Nobody says, all right, goody, goody, goody. It's getting worse and worse and worse. In a manner of speaking, that's what a Holy Ghost-filled child of God is supposed to do because I hope you don't think that you're living in heaven right now. I hope we understand that the Bible said when you see these things begin to come to pass, look up, lift up your head, for your redemption draweth nigh. The only people that are worried, the only people that are scared are those that aren't sure where they're going. I said the only people that are worried and the only people that are scared are the ones that ain't sure where they're going. The Bible says to make your calling and election sure. We have a responsibility and it begins and ends with the Spirit of God. I want to talk about Ephesus for just a minute. We get the Holy Ghost in order to be saved. I really don't want to meddle too much this morning. I'm going to do enough of that tonight. But uh, Ephesus, a powerful epistle, the book of Ephesus, a letter written in the book of Revelation, chapter number 3, I believe it is, to the church at Ephesus, who had doctrinally correct, but they had fallen out of love with the Lord. They were more in love with being right than they were more than they were in love with Jesus. Can I get an amen? I'm going to talk about some characteristics of Ephesus. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world was in Ephesus, the temple of Diana or Artemis. There was anywhere, people try to guess, Ephesus is no longer there and it's just the ruins that they are able to have excavated and, and make a good estimate, but anywhere from 33,000 to 178,000 people were estimated to live in Ephesus. One, one particular uh, 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 archaeologist even estimated as high as 225,000 people lived in Ephesus. There was a theater in Ephesus. And if you read over in the book of Acts chapter number 19, you find that's where Paul was uh, when, uh, when they brought him before the, uh, the authorities in Ephesus and when the Alexander stood up and they, they drowned him out. I'm going to talk about about that just a minute. For two hours they declared great as Diana of the Ephesians to drown out the Jew that was going to speak. They were in this theater and it seated up to 25,000 people and they, they would have plays there that everybody would come out and watch and then they, it morphed into a place where the gladiators would come and as recently as 2007 there was a gladiator graveyard that was uncovered because they would fight to the death. Second only to Rome, Ephesus was in importance and size among the ancient cities. It is possible, appears, that a meteorite had fallen out of the heavens and they claimed that it was thrown down from Zeus and it had great significance to them. They clung to any and all avenues of astrology, magic, and divination. And I said earlier that for two hours, two solid hours, a, a crowd of 25,000 plus cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana of the Ephesians over and over and over again for two hours and I, I really uh, uh, that, that amazes me 
that they were so dedicated to the worship of Diana of the Ephesians. And I'm not going to get into a lot of the, the stuff. If you, if you want to hear me do some plain teaching, you need to show up on Wednesday nights. Uh, but uh, they, uh, the, the, they, they were a very uh, 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 um, uh, promiscuous people. And they were a very uh, passionate people and sensual people. And they integrated much of the worship as the Corinthians had that involved sexuality in an open forum or an open platform. They, they would use lewd sex acts and they dressed it up and called it worship. Matthew 16 and 18, one of our, again, our foundational scriptures, when Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church. And then he says, but the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That is referred to the councils and the wiles. When it talked about the gates of a city, it was where that the, the learned people would come together. So the gates of hell are where the enemy comes together and, and he makes his counsel and he makes his manipulations and, and he tries to, to see what he's going to take to tear down the people of God. You do know that the devil, the, the devil ain't after folks he's already got. <laughs> The people that are sitting under the sound of my voice right now are public enemy number one in hell. Your picture is on a wall somewhere in hell and he gathers imps around and says, I wonder what we can do today to bring them down. The death in the grave is what hell refers to. Sheol. Death in the grave. Hades. But death and the grave are representative of the separation of mankind from his creator, which is God Almighty. But it says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. And that tells us that the struggle is real. From the garden until Calvary, the struggle has been real. And it was totally up to the mercy of God. If someone found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, salvation was made available to every Body, beginning at Jerusalem according to Luke chapter number 24. Before Calvary, it was a few special people that had been picked out for the power of the Holy Ghost to be upon them. And you read in the Old Testament, those people lived this kind of an existence. They would live for God as long as they didn't have food and as long as they didn't have money. But when they got food and when they got money and they got prestige, they turned their back on God. But then Calvary came. Calvary came and with the offer of salvation for all mankind with the with Jesus Christ coming in and saying everybody can be saved with Jesus reaching out and touching a leper and Jesus interacting with the blind and the deaf and the poor and not even being intimidated to speak to the dead and they come out he brought something that confounded and perplexed the minds of the religious authorities because they were used to it being just one here and one here and one here and the I thought that the Jews were the only ones. But when Jesus Christ came, He opened up salvation to whosoever will. And that's what they killed Him for. The struggle is real. The struggle is real. But there's a constant conflict. I hate to use it this way, between the forces of good and the forces of evil, because that sounds almost Star Warsy or Hollywood-like, but a long time before Cecil B. DeMille and those began to, to have uh, silent movies, uh, there was a battle going on between good and evil, between right and wrong, uh, between Lord God Almighty and an angel that was kicked out of heaven called Lucifer. The church. Everybody say the church. The church is the model for what God desires for His people. I'm talking about the church built on the rock. I'm not talking about any particular local assembly right now. But I'm talking about the church that the gates of hell will not prevail against. Understand this, that the Lord ensured. Brother David, we know, my little children, I write these things to you that you sin not. But if you sin, we know each of us as individuals are going to fail. We're going to struggle and we're going to have problems. We're going to wake up on the wrong side of the bed some mornings. We're not going to just be feeling it some mornings. We're going to sometimes, it's like this and sometimes it's like this. But, but we operate so much on our emotions and our feelings that the Lord made many, not just one, but many allowances and reinforcements of His grace and His mercy because if it wasn't for the grace and mercy of God we'd just stay down. But the church, the church, 
I said the church is assured of being victorious. It is the church that is assured of being victorious, of being winning on the winning side. It is the church that we've got to make sure that we stay in, that we keep ourselves submitted to. It's not this flesh, but it is the church of the living God, the ecclesia, the called out, the separated people that God has, uh, has appointed for a particular thing, and that's to help save the world. The church, just as Noah had to stay on the ark, and just as Rahab and her family had to stay in the house on the wall in order to be saved, you've got to be in the church to be saved. And the church is the only place the only place I could come in, the, in this congregation right now and I make no claims to be a prophet. No claims at all. Matter of fact, that scares me a little bit. You ought to be scared too. Just in case the Lord whoops the, the spirit of revelation on me this morning. You talk about we're going to have problems having them just single commodes in the back because everybody knows that when the preacher starts shelling down the corn, about half the people get caught with the stomach bug. They got to go out. But the church, oh Lord Jesus, help me preach this morning. The church is the model of what God ultimately desires for his people. Peace and reconciliation in the church. We have experienced the peace of God in this place this morning. And he has given unto us the ministry and the word of reconciliation, which is bringing people back to God. People, this is it. Where, where you are estranged because of the power of sin. And you are estranged from God because of, of the effects of sin on you. And, and, and He will not dwell in an unclean temple. And, and He will not continue to abide in a place that loves God and loves the world. You can't do it. So it's the church where we preach reconciliation. Where we preach a coming back together. It is the church where you recognize that you are only elevated when you bring yourself down. It's elevation through submission in the church. It is what God desires ultimately. There's a new heaven and a new earth. There's, there's going to be a gathering together in the air. The dead in Christ shall rise first and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet them and so shall we ever be with the Lord. It is the perfection of God's desire and God's plan. But in the meantime, until the trumpet sounds, the church is supposed to operate as, as that vehicle for the Lord. The church is the vehicle by which we might experience the victory of the cross. And it is through the church where there is a witness of the manifold wisdom of God unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Give me Ephesians 3 and 10. It is the church that there is a supernatural witness in the spirit world through the church, through the power of the Holy Ghost working on men and women who have joined themselves to the cause of Jesus Christ. We don't join in a church, we don't become member of a church, that's the idea of a country club or a social club but I was born into the body of Jesus Christ and it requires my submission to the law of God, not the law of the people and the church is the vehicle by which we operate and testify in the spiritual realm. I said the church to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places, that's in the spiritual realm, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. He has created everything. It is the church through which he operates and makes his, his presence known here on earth. It was into the maelstrom of spiritual activity that Paul first entered into Ephesus. In Acts number 18, you find he, he first comes to Ephesus, but he only stayed a little while. And he left Priscilla and Aquila behind, during which time Apollos was shown the way of Jesus Christ more perfectly. You can read it for yourself. It is foolishness. It is foolishness 
to believe that by carnal wiles or carnal manipulation one might battle in the spiritual realm. You cannot, you cannot play mumbly peg with the Holy Ghost uh, flipping it up and down. You cannot play games uh, with the Lord. You cannot expect uh, to continually to live a carnally motivated life uh, and the Lord just show up when all hell breaks loose in your life. That's why you got to come to church and hear what thus saith the word of the Lord. That's why you got to come to church and lift up praise to the Lord, whereby we are purified for operation of the Holy Ghost. I get so disturbed and I have to pray before every service. If you're not careful as a preacher, functioning under a carnal uh, motivation you will preach to just one or two who are knuckleheads but I pray to be able to preach under the authority of the Holy Ghost and for us to recognize that you cannot keep living like the world acting like the world and bless God talking like the world and still represent Jesus Christ Saints of God, we have been called to a higher calling, a peculiar people, and it's not altogether how you look, but it's more importantly how you act. We are representing Jesus. It is here in the world where our actions and our allowing the Holy Ghost to work through us does not just minister to the men and women that are around us, but according to the Word of God, it is our allowing the Holy Ghost to work through us that ministers in the spiritual realm. You say, what in the world's that got to do with me? I was hoping you'd ask. When something's going wrong in our life, When something's going wrong and we're struggling, I don't care if it's financially, I don't care if it's spiritually, emotionally, relationally, however it is, we like to find somebody to blame. We got to find somebody to blame. I said this, I think maybe Wednesday night, maybe last Sunday night, I don't remember. But you can rest assured, if somebody's attacking you, there's something going on inside of them. And you're the face. Paul is very clear that this is not a fleshly battle that we fight with fleshly enemies. How is it that we spend so much time and so much effort in conflicts with people that if you are ever fortunate enough to get yourself right with God, the first thing you're going to have to do is forgive them anyway. Say, well, I'm going to get right with God, but I ain't going to forgive them. Too bad. Go get your party on. Go do everything in the world that you want to do because if you won't forgive, you can't be forgiven. But the problem is, is your battle is not against flesh and blood. Think about it. Think about it. How many of you have read the Old Testament through before? Brother Booby, the people of the Lord whooped everybody that they ever came in contact with, some of them numerous times. Everybody. But you know something, Brother Robbie? They always ended up serving them again. Think about Syria. Think about the Syrians. They came against them. Think about the Philistines. There was one particular time when Israel was living in sin and the Ark of the Covenant showed up and all of Israel just went to nuts, hooping and hollering and yelling. And the Philistines said, Oh no, the Ark is back in their camp. We're beat. And then they went out of battle, whooped Israel, and took the ark. Here's go, here he explains what I'm talking about. Things that are going on in the spiritual realm. Because you think all this stuff you're battling with and all these problems you're battling with is just the flesh. But I come to tell you it's the spirit. Be 
because the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant and they took it captive and they took it to the room where their god Dagon was. And they left the presence of the Lord down below a, an image of a god they had built. And then when they came in the next morning, Dagon had fell over. Then they set it back up. And if I remember the story correctly, they came in the next morning and all of Dagon's arms and head and everything had fell off. Because the Lord recognizes, oh God, it don't matter if the people all turn into knuckleheads, the Spirit's still going to win. And the Spirit's going to keep us holding on till somebody will stand up and declare they that be with us are more than they that be with them. That somebody will stand up and declare if God be for us, who can be against us? Somebody will stand up and declare you're not my enemy, but I'm fighting a spiritual battle and I've got to do it with a spiritual ally. It's called the Holy Ghost. 6 and 12 of Ephesians. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So once again, we're reminded that we need help. That's why he gave us the Holy Ghost. That's why he gave us the Holy Ghost. Think about it. The children of Israel could not stand prosperity. One time the prophet asked him, he said, what in the world are you doing and going and worshiping all these gods? Because just a few weeks ago, we came in and whooped the whole mess of them. They couldn't even deliver those people against you. Well... So our, our battle is not against flesh and blood. But it's against spiritual things. And, and to fight a spiritual battle, you've got to fight with spiritual weapons. Therefore, once again, we need some help. Enter the Spirit. Here comes the Spirit of God. And upon Paul's return to Ephesus, remember Ephesus is, a, is the supernatural capital. They are so enamored and, and they are so blessed because a rock fell out of the sky somewhere and, and declared them as special supernatural people. And Paul returns to Ephesus and he encounters certain disciples. It's not clear to what extent they were disciples, but they have some experience with God. At the very least, they've repented according to John the Baptist preaching. But notice Paul, the first thing he says to them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? It is a question that I present this morning to you is have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? I see people that come and get a blessing and, 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 and get a little bit of goosebumps and, and they feel something from God and, and then they go out and they find themselves defeated once again. And that's because uh, it's not just goose pimples and it's not just a little good feeling, but it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You need the Holy Ghost. Uh, you don't need a good feeling. You don't need a good vibe. You don't need a good emotion. You need the power of God in you. Have you received the Holy Ghost? since you believed why is it that they got to get the Holy Ghost their response was we haven't even heard whether the Holy Ghost has been given we haven't even heard if the Holy Ghost is available and then he says unto them in verse number 3 19 and 3 then he said unto them under what then were you baptized and they said unto John's baptism. Verse number four. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Luke chapter 3, verse 16. John answered, saying unto them all, 
I indeed baptize you with water. But there's one mightier than I cometh. The latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. It was a reminder these people had believed John the Baptist. But they had continued to live their life knowing all that they knew, which was the baptism of John. The baptism under repentance. And when the Apostle Paul saw them, he asked them the most important question that has to do with salvation or being a witness is, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? He reminded them that John the Baptist was continually. He never, he never, Brother David, said that his way was the way. He said, my way is to prepare the way of the Lord. Believe and be baptized according to repentance. It's a turnaround. It is a change. But it's not what you're looking for. There's coming one after me who's mightier than I. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Verse number 5. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And verse 6. And when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. It's not an added blessing. It's not just for special people. But it is the power of God unto salvation. We do not have to be ashamed. We don't need to back down. We don't need to, to try to get a shortcut. We don't need to try to find an easier way. The world is crazy and getting crazier by the minute. And the only way that we're going to be able to stand up in the face of this world is through the influence of the Holy Ghost. I can't believe, I really can't believe the people will malign and ridicule, question, and be divisive over whether or not the Holy Ghost is essential or real or whether everybody needs it. But they're going to continue to do it, saints of God, until they see in us something that they need to have. I read this week, it's a very small thing. The fact that it ever even came up is mind-blowing to me. But in Canada, yesterday or the day before yesterday, the Supreme Court of Canada removed some of the prohibitions on having sexual relations with animals. It wasn't, it wasn't an all out, go ahead, marry your dog if you want to. But Sister Maria, that they even would discuss it. And without the Holy Ghost, and without the Spirit of God, what do you do? It's the Spirit of God. That reminds us, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is He that is in you than He that's in the world. Why is it that that's not the message that we're getting? Why is it that we act as if the world is so great and we're just some little peons uh, trying to hold on till the Lord gets us out of here or we die first? We have the Spirit of God. Romans 8 and 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. John 14, 17, 18, and 19, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, God have mercy. Think about it. Sister Maria, he's everywhere. He is omniscient, he is omnipresent, and he is omnipotent. He is all present, all powerful, and all knowing. He is everywhere. Yes, he's in the beer joint. He's in the dope house. He's everywhere. He's everywhere. But why is it that they don't respond to him? Why is it that they don't allow him into their life? 
That's what the church is for. I'm coming to a close. I know this has been a, a slow morning. The world cannot receive it because it seeth Him not.